Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is amazing. Thank you that you do speak to us through it. Thank you that you are a living God, a living Father, a living Son, and a living Holy Spirit, and that you're, you, the three-in-one God is at work, even today, Lord, even now in this moment, at work in this Zoom session, in the lives of every one of us who are listening, and in, in the life and the, of this world, Lord, you are at work and your plans and your purposes are being fulfilled and that we can know, because we know you and we are known by you, we can know that every single day is ordained by you, that you know the end from the beginning, you know where we are in the history of the world, you know whereabouts we are in this time the last days uh, that began when Jesus was when Jesus died and was resurrected you know where we are in this in this time Lord God and you have prepared and provided everything that we need for it and now as we look at this uh, series that we're doing about you and about your covenant Lord and that we are beloved by a covenant help us to understand all that that means Lord all that that means for us as a corporate body of Christ and for us individually in him. And I praise you, Lord. I praise you that you would bother with telling us this stuff and that you have called us here to hear this today. And I ask, Lord God, that you open our ears and our eyes of faith, that we might hear your voice in it all. In Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I think that uh, last time... Uh, we did get quite a good understanding of the um, purpose of the covenants in the Old Testament and the fact that every single one of them has its foundation in the grace of God. And of course, they all point to the Messiah. They all point to Jesus um, and upon his finished work. So um, the, the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. That's, I think, a key understanding for us that Revelation 13 verse 8 tells us that that the lamb slain before the foundation of the world and um and the whole bible points to him it points to him before he came in our time and it points to him now back to when he came in our time and all of it hinges on who he is and what he did and all the covenants as i say point to him and all the details of the covenants are in some way pictures of him and what he will do so understanding that then let's move on a little bit from the mosaic law which we talked about last time um, to look at the uh, new covenant which uh, galatians tells us we saw this last time Gal paul tells us in galatians that the mosaic law was the tutor that led us to christ it was the guardian um, that led us to christ jesus and um and remember, the word tutor, as I just said, means guardian. And it means it's almost like the law uh, was around to hold our hand and walk us in the way we needed to walk, to take us where we needed to go, because we couldn't get there on our own. But now, in, now that Christ has come, and now we're in this new covenant, now we have this new spirit, the, the Holy Spirit within us, we are able now to walk the way we're supposed to walk without the, the law, the guardian, to take us there. And so, in fact, the guardian did lead us to Christ. The law that was contained in the commandments and the ordinances did lead, of course, the Jews to Christ and led us to Christ. And so, um, but now, now in Christ Jesus and him in us, uh, we have no need of the Mosaic law and it has actually become obsolete that um, it has been um, fulfilled in Christ Jesus and supplanted uh, by him. So understanding that, as I say, um, we want to look at the new covenant, which was first spoken of in the Old Testament through the prophet Jeremiah. It was alluded to in other places, but it was spoken literally uh, called the New Covenant in, uh, through the prophet Jeremiah. And it was spoken to the nation of Judah um, at a time when they were just about to go into exile. In fact, some of them had already gone into exile in Babylon. Um, and uh, Jeremiah speaks actually through the time of the, the sieges of Jerusalem, the three sieges by Nebuchadnezzar, the first one in 605, and then the last one, they were taken into captivity in 586 BC. And so it, Jeremiah is prophesying through that time and, uh, and further into about the middle of their exile. 
and um, just so for people who don't perhaps know uh, about Israel and the separation of the uh, 12 tribes, um, under David, of course, King David, the nation was 12 tribes. He was the king over the whole nation of Israel. And then his son Solomon took the throne and he too uh, was king over the 12 tribes of Israel. But when Solomon died, his son Rehoboam um, was not wise. And, um, and on uh, asking or considering how he would uh, govern and lead his people because they had been by the end of Solomon's life they had been rather oppressed um, he um, he went for advice to his friends his younger friends instead of taking advice from the elders at that time um, he who told him to rule Israel gently and to be kinder than Solomon had become, he uh, took the advice of his friends and said to the Israelites that if they thought Solomon was hard, he was going to be even harder. And that caused a split in Israel. Now that's the human cause. God had already uh, prepared for that and already provided for that in that he'd spoken to a man called Jeroboam and told him that you will be king over 10 of the tribes of Israel. And you can read about that in Kings and Chronicles that it, um, it's all documented there but um, when that what that happened was that um, the 12 tribes of Israel split and 10 of the tribes went with Jeroboam and only two stayed with Rehoboam. One was Judah and one was Benjamin. And uh, so from then onwards, from the end of Solomon's reign, the nation was split into two. And um, over the following few hundred years, God sent prophets to each of those kingdoms, the northern kingdom, which was under Jeroboam, so the 10 tribes, and the southern kingdom called Judah under Rehoboam. And, and they, of course, died and other kings took their place and so on and so forth, all of which you can read, as I say, in Kings and Chronicles. And what happens is God sends prophet after prophet after prophet and says, come back to me, come back to me, come back to me. And occasionally, there are some revivals in the history of Judah, but none in the history of the 10 tribes of, of Israel. They had about 19 kings, and every one of them is described as doing evil in the sight of the Lord. And Judah, probably about the same number of kings, I can't remember if it's 18 or 19, um, and some of those kings followed the ways of David uh, and the ways of God, but the majority of them followed the ways of the kings of Israel and uh, did evil in the sight of the Lord. And so what has happened is in 722 BC, the 10 tribes of Israel are taken captive by the Assyrians and taken and they are exiled from their land, taken up into Assyria and dispersed up there. That is all the ones who weren't killed in the um, besieging of Israel. And um, and the empire, the emperor of Israel, the king of Assyria, the king, moved people from Babylon back into, um, into Samaria, which had been the capital of the northern kingdom. And those people um, took over the land and actually uh, uh, married the uh, few remaining Israelites that were there. And um, consequently, in Jesus' day, um, that's why the Jews hated the Samaritans, because they were, as far as the Jews were concerned, half-breeds. They were a mix of Israelites and these uh, Assyrians, or the people that the Assyrians had brought in. And so, um, but Judah continued, because they had a couple of revivals going on in their history, although the 10 tribes of Israel were taken captive in 722 BC, the two tribes continued and had success under kings like Hezekiah um, and Uzziah. And, and so they had success. But again, the prophets came and they preached God's word to Judah. And Judah, uh, by and large, didn't... Um, didn't respond in obedience and faith. And so in 605 BC, um, as I've just said, um, the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, comes against Jerusalem and in a series of three sieges, finally destroys Jerusalem and takes the 
the, the Jews now, remember it's Judah and Benjamin called the Jews, takes them off into exile, into captivity in Babylon, where they are going to remain for 70 years. And that time, 70 years, has already been told to them that I will send you into exile for 70 years. And the reason that God does that is because they have not kept his commands. And specifically, one of the things he states is you didn't give the land the rest that the sabbath rests that i told you to give and so because you didn't do that every seven years the land was to lay fallow and that was an act of faith because what they had to believe was that god would provide for them in a year that they didn't plant crops and so this is an act of faith. It's an act of trusting that God will do what he's promised to do. And they didn't do it. And so because of that, God says, for every seven years that you didn't do it, I'm going to put you into exile for um, that time. And so you can work it out. 70 times seven is 490. So for roughly 490 years of their history, they had not allowed the land to lay fallow. And it gives you an understanding of how far the people of God had moved away from the commands of God and the covenant of God. Remember, they're in covenant relationship with God and he has given them and given them time and time and time again. He has given them the opportunity to turn back to him. And in the end, he says, that's it now. That's it. You are going to go into exile for 70 years and then I am going to bring you back. And it is the then I am going to bring you back that introduces the new covenant and um, introduces what uh, Jeremiah is going to talk about in between. I think in the homework, I asked you to read through from Jeremiah 29 to 33. It's a really exciting part of the book of Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah is quite hard to read because it's very straightforward. Jeremiah or God through Jeremiah is a very plain speaker. And what he tells Israel or Judah is exactly the state of how they've been. He says, you're listening to prophets who prophesy peace, peace, when there is no peace. You are listening to lying prophets, lying teachers, lying shepherds, and they are leading you astray. And you must come back to me. And over and over and over again, Jeremiah is calling them back. And actually, at the time that Jeremiah is prophesying, Ezekiel, Habakkuk, Daniel, they're all uh, those, those books are all uh, talking about this time. Ezekiel talking about a time. Ezekiel is one of the first captives to be taken from Jerusalem and taken into Babylon. And when you read his, his account, you hear what God is talking about, how he's going to remove his spirit, remove his presence from the temple. In Jerusalem and you see that played out when when Nebuchadnezzar destroys the temple and Daniel who's reading the book of Jeremiah um, in Daniel chapter 9 and he comes to this understanding that the time is up he's been in, in, in the palace of Nebuchadnezzar and then Nebuchadnezzar's sons for the last 70 years and he reads this book of Jeremiah and he understands we're coming to the end of this exile time and he begins to pray in uh, chapter 9 of Daniel praying along aligning his prayers with the revealed word and will of God that came through Jeremiah and so it's so important I think for our time you know all of that history of Israel I find that fascinating I love that history and I love that I can find it and know it only from the scriptures I can find if I like um, historical books that will tell me the same things but from the scriptures themselves this book that people tell me is not real and it's just a load of fables and myths here I can read God's history of his people his covenant people israel and see how he dealt with them and i can understand why he dealt with them that way and how he dealt with them and how his heart was broken his heart was broken at the state of his people and the fact that they would have to go off into exile so that they would understand that he is God and that his love is never ending and that his mercy and his grace are always available. And, and I want to know that now, and I know you do too. We need to know that because we are heading into times already in them that are beyond us. 
that are difficult and God is calling, calling, calling us to come back to him, to stay with him, to stand up for him, to fight for him. I mean, I, I just, the other day, I think I posted it on Facebook because I read in Psalm 144, the first verse of Psalm 144, blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. Or maybe it's the other way around, my, thing, my hands for battle and my, my fingers for war. But Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for battle and my fingers for war. Blessed be the Lord, who through his word is enabling me to stand and to fight for him, for his name, for his reputation, for the truth of his faithfulness, for his enduring and overwhelming loving covenant with every single one who calls upon his name. I will be found by you, he says, if you call me and seek me with all of your heart. And every single one of us have come to him and said, Lord God, make yourself known to me. And that is what he's done. And how wonderful, what a privilege that is, that he has done that for people like you and people like me. So we've come into this understanding of covenant, this understanding and, and this understanding that everything that God has been doing with the world and with his covenant people, Israel, has been pointing, pointing, pointing to the salvation and the deliverance of mankind that will come through God alone in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Jeremiah 29, um, but to um, chapter 29 to chapter 33, God will lay out what is going to happen. So we're going to begin in Jeremiah 29. And I'm just going to read a few verses. We can't read all of this. I just really would recommend that you go back and read these chapters because they are the announcement, the proclamation of the new day that is coming, the new covenant that is coming. And we can understand from that because we know we live under the new covenant and that what God promises in the new covenant has been partially fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus Christ, but will be finally fulfilled in his second coming. So let's just read um, Jeremiah 29 verse 1. Now these are the words of the letter which Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the rest of the elders of the exile, the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So you know, this is a letter that Jeremiah sends from Jerusalem to all the elders and priests and people who have already been taken to Babylon. And then verse 10 and 11, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. So first of all, what we have to understand is these are words spoken to his covenant people, Judah. Israel, because actually what happened under some of the good kings of Judah, they called the people, the God-fearing people of, of Israel, back to God. And, and they came. Hezekiah, for example, he sent an invitation out to the people of the ten tribes that had gone to the northern kingdom. If you want to worship God at the place God has decided, come back, come back. You're our brothers. You can come. And Josiah the, the king in Second, uh, Second Chronicles chapter 34, the one where they find the book of the law um, in the broken down temple of the law, he calls people back. There was always the opportunity to come back, come back, come back and worship God at the place that he had decided for his name to dwell, namely Jerusalem. And so now this word that's coming through Jeremiah at a time of great, great destruction and tribulation, at a time when they are under attack and have been attacked by the Babylonians, when it looks like all is lost. God comes in through Jeremiah, for I know the plans I have for you, plans for welfare and not calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I mean, we could go on. I'd love to read all these verses because they're just so wonderful. God speaking to his people in the midst of their most bitter trial. 
in the midst of the, the besieging and the destruction and then the exile of them into Babylonia. Babylonians were wicked, cruel people, and they, they destroyed Jerusalem and, um, and, and killed so many people. In the first captivity, they probably took Daniel away in the first captivity. They took all the noble sons and all the um, high ranking people. And those sons, like Daniel, probably 14, 15, 16 years old, Nebuchadnezzar took into his, temp in his uh, temple and his palace and had them castrated, almost certainly had them castrated so that they would serve him. And um, Daniel was one of those boys. Can you imagine it? Can you imagine ripped out of your nation, ripped away from your family, put into a palace of a pagan vicious king castrated and made to serve that king and Daniel served the the emperors the kings for 70 years trusting in the Lord his God trusting that though the circumstances around him made no sense though he couldn't understand what was happening he trusted that God was at work and for you and me in the days we live in and the days that are coming you and I may not understand all that's happening we may not understand what's coming next you know I'm always looking at the news and the reports and the locust plagues that are just absolutely catastrophic in Africa and parts of the Middle East and Asia and then you've got now in China they've maybe found another virus coming up in pigs I forget where it is just in this last few days and that it's a bit like swine flu but not swine flu that came in what 2009 something like that and so now this is another virus that may that may become like coronavirus that that is is passable from animals to humans and so what they're saying is there's a warning going out be careful there are articles that you can read about the sun having no movement 2019 and 2020 it has had no sun's flares no sun spots and what that means is that we are possibly going into a time of extreme cold and that will have effect on crops around the world and it will have effect on you and I. The things that are happening in our world where for such a long time, in fact, in my lifetime, haven't really had much effect on me. Now they are at the door and I won't be able to understand all of what's happening in my world, but I will be able to know that God is at work in my life. He is at work in this planet, on this planet, and he is bringing about his fulfillment, his plans, his purposes, and that one day, maybe not today, but one day, I will be hit with him in glory. Why? Because these promises made to Israel, made to Judah, I know the plans I have for you, plans for welfare and not calamity, to give you a future and a hope, I have become a part of this covenant promise. I have been brought into this covenant by the Lord Jesus Christ. I know that we're going to look at that and we're only on the first page of my notes and I haven't got anywhere, but please let's hang on to this truth that what, though we don't understand the details, the details of everything that's going on, though sometimes it can be scary, though sometimes we can think, well, what's gonna happen next? What's gonna happen? Though those things are happening, we can know that the foundation we stand on is a rock. It is solid and cannot be shaken. Though the whole world shakes, you and I can stand firm on the rock who is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord is training our hands for war and our fingers for battle. He is training us to know how to fight, to fight to fight with strength, to fight with courage, to fight with boldness, to bring about the, the, the salvation of the people around us, the deliverance, to snatch people from the fire, as Jude will say, to, to be able to speak and proclaim the truth to a people who are desperate, desperately searching and without hope. So these plans that God has for us, Jeremiah, it's going to talk about in these uh, in these following couple of chapters. And uh, one thing to remember as we look at them is that always in prophecy, well, 
99% of the time. The prophets are not just speaking of their own time. They are speaking of their own time often, but they're also speaking of a, a future time and then a far distant future. Isaiah is talking about four. He's talking about his own time, of soon time to come, and then two further horizons. So it's almost as if what we're given is, as we read and as we study, we're given a kind of a layout. Um, a route map of what God is going to do. And sometimes it's a bit hazy because it's a long way in the distance and it's hard to make that out. Sometimes it's so clear because it's right here and now. And, um, but the, um, the horizons that, that Jeremiah gave, there are three, I think. The, the nearer, the first horizon or the nearer one was the return of Judah out of Babylon in 70 years back to Jerusalem. And the further one, of course, was the calling of Israel from all the nations um, uh, around the earth. And um, we need to figure out which one is which, and we need to understand that God sometimes talks about both horizons actually in the same paragraph, and sometimes even in, the, in, the, in just a couple of sentences. So, um, through these, through Jeremiah, God is going to describe this, this dawning of a new day for Israel, for his people Israel, not only for the exiles in Babylon, but also for the Jewish people before the Lord Jesus returns. Um, I, I want to say one thing here, um, and I can't back it up, I, well, I can back it up in scripture, but I don't have the time here, because otherwise we'll never get through these chapters, but uh, I want to say one thing that the uh, call of God or the, the coming back to Israel now, since 1948 when they became a nation and the, the Jews that are making Aliyah back to uh, Israel from all over the world, this is not what God is talking about in Jeremiah. The Jews that are coming back to Jerusalem now are coming back for judgment. I think we have to understand this clearly. Um, and the Jews will be judged whether they be in Israel or anywhere in the world. There is coming a great tribulation and it's called the time of Jacob's distress. And it is a great tribulation where the Jews are going to be persecuted. Where if you read in Revelation, Satan is going to be thrown down. And when he does, he's going to persecute the Jews like they have never been persecuted before. And of course he's going to do, the world is going to face all sorts of and all manner of tribulation and trouble, but the Jews, the Jews, the, the covenant people of God, are going to be facing a tribulation such as they have never faced before. And when you think about that, think about everything that has been done to the nation of Israel, to the Jews, since the beginning of their formation. Think about the persecution, the tribulation. Think about just in, you know, in, in the Second World War, the First World War. Think about the programs in, in European countries. Think about the anti-Semitism that is rampant in our world today. And then multiply that and think about it. The end time tribulation is going to be a tribulation, a distress. Jacob calls, um, Daniel calls it the time of Jacob's distress and it is going to be worse than, than it has ever been and that is what's going to come upon Israel before Jesus returns. So when we're talking about in Jeremiah the wonderful glorious new day that's coming for Israel, we're looking beyond the tribulation to the time at the end of the tribulation when the Lord Jesus Christ returns and makes his stand upon the earth, who stands in Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives and calls his people, brings his people back to a time when they will be there in the land of Israel for the millennial reign of Jesus, for the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ on earth when things will be as they were supposed to be all of their history, when they will be the chief of nations and not the tail, when they will have a king again in Jerusalem, when there will be a temple there, when people can come from all over the world and will have to come and to worship the Lord their God. So through the prophet Jeremiah, what we call chapters 29 and 30 to 33, God describes this new day. And uh, remember that it's a promise that began in Genesis chapter 3. Uh, it's that the, um, the uh, promise is going to come um, from the seed of the woman. It's a promise that um, 
that was established uh, then and uh, um, with God's covenant people because the Messiah promised in Genesis 3 would come through the line of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, that the nation that God would make for himself would be the nation that brought the Messiah in, in his human form. And, um, and uh, even though the Israelites, by the time we get to Jeremiah, have just completely disregarded God's God, who God is and what he's called them to do, even though they have done all of those things, even though he has sent the 10 tribes into exile in Assyria and they have been assimilated, even though he's now sending Judah into Babylon, God never has forgotten his covenant promises and he never breaks them. And so even at the time that this is happening, he is already promising a day when he will bring them back. Um, and here, probably at their lowest ebb, um, he speaks through Jeremiah so that they would know that he hasn't forgotten his promise. And that's something we have to remember, you know, that there are times when we walk away, when we don't do what God has called us to do, when we know that actually we should have done something different, but we chose to go our own way. When we understand that we have really you know, what is it that God talks about putting a twig to the nose? When we have thumbed our nose at the Lord and said, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to go my way. I, I, I just can't listen to you. I just can't. I can't do it. Even then, God is there with his unbreakable covenant, with his un, unbreakable love. He is still there and he is still calling and he is still ready to receive you back to himself when you come. And um, uh, as I say here, at possibly their lowest ebb, he, um, he makes his promise, he reiterates actually, the promise that was made from the beginning of our human history, the promise that was established through Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And he reiterates that pro uh, promise and starts to talk in these chapters about the new covenant. So uh, could you turn to Jeremiah chapter 30, and we'll just read um, verse 1 to 3. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Write all the words which I have spoken to you in a book. For behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah. The Lord says, I will also bring them back to the land that I gave to their forefathers, and they shall possess it. So again here, this, this reiteration of the covenant of the land, the land covenant, that God gave this land to his people Israel, and he is going to bring them back into it. And note here that God's talking about Israel, the ten tribes that went north, and the two tribes of Judah, and he's bringing them back. He's going to bring his people back to the land that I gave to their forefathers, and they will possess it. Um, so this promise ultimately has its future in the, the return of Israel and Judah. Let's, let's say always now for, will be called Israel. It, they're going to be brought back when Jesus comes again the second time. This is a promise for the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's going to be his promise of redemption. Look at verse 10. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, declares the Lord, and do not be dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save you from afar and your offspring from the land of their captivity. And Jacob will return and will be quiet and at ease and no one will make him afraid. So this is, has a near horizon, the 70 years, and a far horizon when they come back at the end of the tribulation. And this picture, really, of... Um, of a far coming back, um, if they understood it, would have encouraged the uh, Jews in, in Babylon anyway, because if God can bring back people from wherever they are, look at what he says in verse one, um, I will bring them back to the land that I gave to their forefathers and they shall possess it. And um, uh, I, I didn't read, I probably should have read, I'm going to read on a little bit from verse 3. So now these are the words which the Lord spoke concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus says the Lord, I have heard a sound of terror, of dread, and there is no peace. Ask now and see if a male can give birth. 
Why do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in childbirth? And why have all faces turned pale? Alas, for that day is great. There is none like it. And it is the time of Jacob's distress, but he will be saved from it. It shall come about on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off their neck and will tear off their bonds and strangers will no longer make them their slaves, but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, declares the Lord, and do not be dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save you from afar and your offspring from the land of captivity. And Jacob will return and will be quiet and at ease and no one will make him afraid for I am with you declares the Lord to save you for I will destroy completely all the nations where I have scattered you only I will not destroy you completely but I will chasten you justly and will no, by no means leave you unpunished so here we have God's promise to his people that at the end of a time called Jacob's distress and as I say you can cross-reference that phrase in Daniel, in Ezekiel, in various other places, Jesus talks about that in Matthew 24, you can cross-reference that and know that that is for the time of the end of the tribulation but Jeremiah is sending this to the people in Babylon, the people who have been taken captive in Babylon, and he's telling them that God will bring them back. So it has a, a 70 year horizon and then a 2000 and something year horizon maybe 2,400 year horizon. He, it has two horizons. But think about it, if you're in Babylon and you are thinking about what's happened to you, you are just so pleased to be hearing from God that he is going to bring you back. And that redemption that he's promised is talked about in, in several ways. First of all, as I've just read, the idea that, uh, that God will break the yoke of the, the oppressors, of the people who have held Israel captive. Um, uh, where are we? Um, da, 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 da. Verse eight, it shall come about on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off their neck and tear off their bonds and strangers will no longer make them their slaves. So there's a day coming when Israel will be delivered. It's the, it's the end of, of the time called Jacob's distress, a time that describes the tribulation. You can see that in Daniel chapter 12, verse one. Matthew 24, 21 to 31, Mark 13, 19 to 27, and Revelation chapter 6 through 19. And I gave you those scriptures. Hopefully you got them with the invitation. So look up those scriptures and, and cross-reference that time of Jacob's distress. Um, what we're seeing here is there's this, this use of this description of a woman in labor. And that's used. That, he says in... Um, in verse six, if a male could give birth, why do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in childbirth? This idea of labor that is going to bring in the, um, the uh, uh, tribulation in the time of the end. Isaiah chapter 13, verse eight, talks about that. First Thessalonians five, verse one to three. And um, this promise of a millennial kingdom, but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them. So God's promise that there's going to be a return to the land, that it's gonna come through a time or at the end of a time of great distress, but that it is coming and that he is going to have, they're gonna serve the Lord their God and they are going to have David their king on the throne in Israel. The promise. Uh, Jeremiah 23 verse 5 to 6 and 33 verse 14 to 26. Um, remember when Jesus came the first time the Jews said we will not have this man rule over us. We won't have him as our king and our messiah but in the end at the end of Jacob's distress they will welcome him back. They will welcome him back as their messiah king. Um, let's pray. Father, thank you that uh, we can uh, chat together about you. Thank you that we can um, enjoy fellowship, sweet fellowship around your word, Lord. Thank you that, that you showed that to me so long ago in my Christian life and really right at the beginning that there's nothing like it to be together around your word. And um, I pray, Lord, that uh, we would become so 
um, passionate about it, that uh, that passion would seep out of us with everybody we talk to and uh, that uh, our knowledge of you would increase so much that we would find ourselves much more gracious and more wise and more able to lead other people um, towards you, Lord Jesus. And, um, and we pray that, Father, because we know that um, these are desperate days and that you want us to do this um, and that it is a great privilege that we have been called into it. And so I pray for every single person here, Lord, everyone listening, I pray that your hand would be upon us, that we would know that we know that we know that you are here with us and that we need not be afraid, that we can trust that our lives are held securely in your hand. And I thank you so much for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, uh, um, I see someone's asked a question in the in the chat bar, um, uh, and it's a technical question about Jacob's distress, Jacob's trouble. Is it um, is it the whole time of the tribulation, the seven years, or is it only the three and a half years? And I think you could probably say that it will um, be the last three and a half years of the the time called the tribulation, the seven year tribulation, because. Uh, from the midpoint of the tribulation, the Antichrist will stand in the temple that will have been built in Jerusalem and will declare himself to be God. And that's when uh, Jesus in Matthew 24 says, if you are in Judea at that time, if you're in Jerusalem and if you're in Judea, get out of town because there will be a time of distress such as has never been seen from the beginning of time until then. So um, I think that probably, even though the, the persecution of the Jews is still going on around our world and has never ceased actually, that uh, from the midpoint of the tribulation, um, uh, th that would be the time that you could probably call Jacob's distress. Um, so getting back to Jeremiah, um, uh, we, we've seen in, in chapter 30 that God is going to uh, save his people from the time of Jacob's distress. He's going to um, break the yoke uh, from their necks and their bonds and strangers will no longer make them slaves. That's Jeremiah 30 verse 8. So we're going to pick it up again in verse 12 uh, because uh, Jeremiah, God through Jeremiah is using different pictures really for his people and as I say it's a, t a terrible time for them because they're going into Babylon and they are already many of them already there and they are slaves and exiles they've they've been forcibly taken from uh, from their home and taken to a distant land to serve a wicked um, uh, a, a, a wicked empire if you want to read about that I uh, think look read Habakkuk Habakkuk has this vision that God gives him and it's a vision of a terribly destructive and evil and wicked people coming to to attack to take over his own people and he cries out to God how can this be how would you use these people to punish and discipline us and um and, and yeah, if you want to read that, read Habakkuk. Um, but here we're back now in uh, Jeremiah chapter 30, and we're going to pick it up from verse 12. Um, For thus says the Lord, your wound is incurable and your injury is serious. There is no one to plead your cause, no healing for your sore, no recovery for you. All your lovers have forgotten you. They do not seek you. For I have wounded you with the wound of an enemy, with the punishment of a cruel one, because your iniquity is great and your sins are numerous why do you cry out over your injury your pain is incurable because your iniquity is great and your sins are numerous i have done these sorry because your iniquity is great and your sins are numerous i have done these things to you therefore all who devour you will be devoured and all your adversaries every one of them will go into captivity and those who plunder you will be for plunder and all who prey upon you i will give for prey for i will restore you to heaven Health, and I will heal you of your wounds, declares the Lord, because they have called you an outcast, saying, it is Zion, no one cares for her. So Judah, we see here, is a sick nation. That's what God calls them, a sick nation. And they're sick because of the, 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 the false teaching and the wrong prophecies, the, the deception that has been fed to them. Just quickly, if you can, go back to Jeremiah chapter 6. And... Um, and look at uh, verse 14, um, 
well actually let's go to um verse 13 the prophets are as wind and the word is not in them oh sorry 6 14 <laughs> Um, well, it's the same thing, actually. The word is not in them and they're, uh, they're talking rubbish. But verse 14 of chapter 6 of Jeremiah, they have healed the brokenness of my people superficially, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. And then chapter 8, verse 11, um, uh, they heal the brokenness of, my, of the daughter of my people superficially, saying, peace, peace, but there is no peace. Were they ashamed because the abomination they had done? They certainly were not ashamed, and they did not know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall, and at the time of their punishment, they will be brought down, says the Lord. The reason that, that Judah now are in the situation they're in is largely because the people that are supposed to be leading them and directing them have been leading and directing them the wrong way. And so... Um, the sickness had become worse and worse and worse. And, and now their wounds were so bad that uh, there was no medicine that could cure the nation. And the people that they'd relied on um, ha were not to be found um, uh, because they have called you an outcast. All your lovers, verse 14 of chapter 30 of Jeremiah, all your lovers have forgotten you. They do not seek you for I have wounded you with the wound of an enemy, with the punishment of a cruel one, because your iniquity is great and your sins are numerous. So, um, uh, but God is going to punish the nations that punish Israel and Judah. And even though that's something that's really important also for us to see is that God uh, uh, punishes or uh, judges his people using other people, other nations, and he brings those other nations against his people Israel, but they most often go way too far. And so God um, actually, in as I said in Habakkuk, he's going to say that um, they enjoyed the um, punishment or the uh, consequences that they uh, came against Israel. They enjoyed it too much and they went even further than they were supposed to go. And so God is going to punish them too. So um, God is going to punish and he's going to use the Gentile nations to correct Israel. And then he's going to bring them back and heal their wounds. Um, uh, and, and, and they have God's promise to them. And I will restore you to health and I will heal you of your wounds, declares the Lord, because they have called you an outcast, saying it is Zion. No one cares for her. And then going on in verse 18, what Jeremiah does, what God does through Jeremiah is he uses the picture of a storm. Um, thus says the Lord, behold, I will restore the fortunes of the tents of Jacob and have compassion on his dwelling places and the city will be rebuilt on its ruin and the palace will stand on its rightful place. From them will proceed thanksgiving and the voice of those who celebrate and I will multiply them and they will not be diminished. I will also honour them and they will not be insignificant. Their children also will be as formerly and their congregation shall be established before me and I will punish all their oppressors. Their leader shall be one of them, and their ruler shall come forth from their midst, and I will bring him near, and he shall approach me. For who would dare to risk his life to approach me, declares the Lord? You shall be my people, and I will be your God. Behold the tempest of the Lord. Wrath has gone forth, a sweeping tempest. It will burst on the head of the wicked. The fierce anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has performed and until he has accomplished the intent of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand this. So Jeremiah talking about a storm that's coming, but then the calm after the storm in the latter days. Um, God's promising that he'll rebuild the cities of Judah and it will be that their fortunes, the people's fortunes will be restored and their mourning will turn to joy and their children will enjoy normal life. And instead of being under the terrible Gentile rulers, the Jews will have one of their own as ruler over them. That is, they will have a Jew and their leader shall be one of them. Um, and their ruler shall come forth from their midst. So, um, verse 21, who's going to be the leader of the Jews? Uh, I believe, and I think that you could make a case from scripture, I believe that you can make a case from scripture that it will be the resurrected David, who will be the king of Israel in the day of um, 
of their coming back with the Lord Jesus at the end of the tribulation. Um, the king or the prince of Israel, he'll be called uh, in the millennial reign of Christ. You can look at that in Ezekiel 34, 23 to 24, Ezekiel 37, verse 24, and Ezekiel 45, verse 22. There will be a resurrection of Old Testament saints. They are not part of the church. They are part of Israel, part of the remnant of Israel, and they will, and David will be among them. And I mean, he is a man described as a man after God's own heart, and he will be the king or the prince of Israel in the millennial reign of Christ. So the, uh, the summary really of chapter 30, the people of Judah and Jerusalem are going to experience terrible trials and uh, destruction at the hands of the Babylonians. They're going to end up wearing the Gentile yoke. They're going to bear wounds for their sins and they're going to endure the storm of God's wrath because of the fact that they have consistently and deliberately disobeyed him, walked away. But God is eventually going to deliver them. He's going to break the yoke. He's going to cure their sickness and the, there's going to be a calm after the storm. And all of that that's going to happen for these Jews who are going into exile in Babylon because all of these things are going to happen they're going to come back to their land they're going to build another temple they're going to have a ruler over them again so all of those things are going to happen then when they come out of the Babylonian exile and after 70 years but it's also going to happen the final fulfillment will be at the end of the tribulation and this is all part of the promise that we're going to read in Jeremiah 31. It's all part of the regeneration that God is going to do. The, the, fight, the new covenant that is going to come into effect is pictured, uh, the things that are going to happen is pictured in the history of Israel. The, uh, the things that will happen at the time of distress, at the time of Jacob's distress, and they're coming back to Israel, are all pictured through the events of their history. Um, and uh, because God has made an everlasting, unbreakable covenant promise through his, through his, to his people, through Abraham. Um, it's an everlasting covenant. It's a literal covenant. It is an unconditional covenant. Uh, and it is the promise of God to his beloved people, Israel. It doesn't mean that they always get things right. As you read their history, you see that time and time and time again, they disobey God. They walk away from him. They don't believe. They don't trust and they don't do even what they've caught, what he's called them to do. Even when his presence was with him in the wilderness, when they first came out of, of Egypt, it, the, his God's presence was there in a pillar of fire at night and a pillar of cloud in the day. Even when he was there with them, they were still rebelling. So this is not that you have to agree with everything that Israel does today but you must agree and align yourself with God. God has made a covenant, eternal, literal, everlasting, unconditional promise to Israel. He has called them his own. The Messiah came through that nation and he has promised that one day at the time of the end, at the time when their final tribulation, the time of their distress is over, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back the second time, he has promised that they will again be in their land. They will be uh, ruled by their king, and I think David, and the Lord will be God in their midst. An amazing, amazing time. And uh, you and I can pray, align ourselves with the revealed will of God. We can pray for the day that Jesus will come back. We can pray for the peace of Jerusalem, as the psalm says. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. The peace of Jerusalem is the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray that the Lord Jesus comes back. Pray for the people of Israel, that they would see their Messiah, that they would see him before this time of Jacob's distress. Pray for the Jews. The gospel is to go to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Romans chapter 1. It's not that God doesn't want the Gentiles or Greeks. It doesn't mean that he doesn't want them. It means that he still wants the Jews. He still wants his people, Israel, to turn to him and to put their trust in Messiah. So as you pray for Israel, as you align yourself with the work of God, pray that the Jews individually will come to know the Saviour the Lord Jesus Christ, 
pray that they will know him so that they will not have to go through this time of distress, this Jacob's distress that is coming upon them. Pray that they will uh, be uh, removed and become part of the church before it, because this is a time of such distress that has never been seen. So uh, going on then, um, understanding this unconditional, literal, everlasting covenant with Israel, we are going to go on and look at the, 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 how, how God describes this new covenant that he will make with his people in those days, his people Israel in those days. So turn in, the, in your Bible, uh, um, Jeremiah 31, go to uh, verse 31. Um, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbour and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel will also cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth, so earth searched out below, then I, will cast, then I will also cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares the Lord. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when the city will re be rebuilt for the Lord from the tower of Hananel to the corner gate. The measuring line will go out farther straight ahead to the hill Gareb, and then it will turn to Goa. And the whole valley of the dead bodies and of the ashes and all the fields as far as the brook Kidron to the corner of the horse gate towards the east shall be holy to the Lord. It shall not be plucked up or overthrown any more forever. This is an absolutely categoric promise made to Israel through Jeremiah at the time that he is writing to those Jews that are being taken into exile or have already been taken into exile in Babylon. And it is the promise of a new covenant. And as God says, not like the covenant I made with them when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant which they broke. That's the Mosaic covenant, the Mosaic law, which which they broke time and time and time again. Um, and this covenant's not going to be like that because they're not going to have, you're not going to have to teach everybody how to do it because they're all going to know me. And, and this is not a covenant that's going to be written on stone. This is a covenant that I'm going to write on their hearts because I'm going to put my spirit within them. Um, uh, and I will be their God. I will put my law within them and on their heart. I will write it and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they will not teach again, know the Lord, for all will know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. And if you want to know how sure this promise is, how strong this covenant promise is, if you want to know if he's broken it or changed it, then understand. Can you measure? the heavens has anything happened is the fixed order of the moon and the stars far light by night has that changed has the um has has anything changed in the heavenly order can you do any of the things that he says can the heavens be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out if you can do that then i will cast off israel but if not this promise is secure and it's a no-brainer we know that that's what he's saying he's saying this is an everlasting um eternal covenant promise with my people israel and i will forgive their iniquity and their sin i will remember no more i will write my law on their hearts 
and they won't need to teach each other because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. This is not just a revived old covenant. This is a totally new covenant in every way. It's inward. It's written on their heart. The old covenant controlled their conduct. Think about that. The old covenant um, controlled their, uh, what they did, but it could not control, could not change their heart. That's the thing we have to remember. And that actually is, I, I wrote in my notes because I wanted to think about that a little bit more. You know, we have believed in the West. Uh, we have believed in the philosophies that we are being fed now. And that is that if you, uh, if you give people the right environment and if you give them enough education and if you give them material and physical well-being, if you guarantee their health and if you, um, uh, as I say, give them education and wealth, then they will live righteously. They'll live good lives. But that's just not true. And that, we see that time and time and time again. We see that the, a good education doesn't change the character, that a good environment cannot change the character. They can help, but they cannot change the fundamental human nature. They cannot change it. God must do something to enable or to cause people to love him because that's the essence of the law. The essence of the law was you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength and mind and love your neighbour as yourself. And we cannot do that unless God does something to us. In our humanness, in our human nature, we cannot do that perfectly unless God enables us. And the thing is, when you look at the history of Israel, as I said earlier, there were often revivals that happened under various kings. But as soon as that king died, then they would go back to the old ways. They would revert to the nature that was within them, the nature that said, this is all about me, that I'm the most important that I must have this and I must have that and I must be independent and I have to choose my own way. That's what we see throughout human history. Yes, of course, it's punctuated by people who do good things. There are many, many, many people, atheists, Buddhists, Muslims, um, Sikhs, who do good things. But to be the sort of person that God is calling us to be, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength and mind and to love your neighbour as yourself, you cannot do that without the work of God within you. And it is when you realise that, when you understand that you cannot be what you may want to be, you cannot be righteous, you cannot live the way that you want to live consistently, you cannot do it, when you see that you cannot do it without God doing something, that is the moment that you come to him and say, Lord God, I need help. I'm a sinner and I can't get to you. And that's the time God says, come in. Here's the lamb slain for you before the foundation of the world. I knew that you needed a savior and so I came for you. That's what it is. That's what it's always been. You need a saviour and here he is. You can't get to God even if you want to. And most of us didn't want to most of the time. But when you suddenly see the reality that God is real, that he exists and that he is holding out his hand to you, when you understand that great love of God for you that would cause him to send his son to live and to die in your place, when you even get a glimpse of it and something in you stirs and says, I, I want to know you, God. I want to know you. Then God comes in. He comes in with his spirit and his love and his joy and his peace. And he fills you up so that you are able to love him and to love your neighbor as yourself. And this has come because God has decided, decided before the foundation of the world, that he would inaugurate a new covenant. He would inaugurate a new covenant. He has done his work through his people, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He has done this work through them so that the whole world will look and see that 
even the covenant people of God, even the people that God has made himself known to and has given his rules and his ordinances to, even they couldn't full, um, fully fulfill the law that he, or the righteousness, the standard that he called them to. And so what hope is there for me? What hope is there for me? And so he made it possible. He made a way for you and I to receive his spirit, to be brought back to life, real life, to find a way to come to him in Christ Jesus. And it's just an amazing promise. It's an amazing promise. And as I said, it's not, um, it's not that the Mosaic law was bad. It was good. It was holy. It was righteous because it was a reflection of God's character. And even, even within that, he made the way possible for those people to come to him um, and to uh, be forgiven for their sins. Even when, they, even when they, they had deliberately rebelled, he still made a way for them to come to him if they came you know, in repentance and faith. And the sacrifices uh, ordained in the Mosaic law all pointed, pointed to the one time for all, the once for all sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf. And the difference between the old covenant and the new is that the old covenant was simply a, sh a, a way outside of you. It showed you how you should be. But the new covenant is a, a covenant written on your heart because God has given you a new heart and he has put his spirit within you. Um, so the, uh, the law gave the knowledge of sin, uh, Romans 3 verse 20, but in um, the new covenant, we have uh, the promise of forgiveness and the sin will be remembered no more. Now remember, this is a covenant made to a nation. This is a corporate covenant as the Mosaic law was a corporate covenant given to Israel. The Mosaic law wasn't given to the rest of the world. It was given to Israel. And so the, uh, the Mosaic law given to Israel and the new covenant given to Israel, these are two, they're the same. God works in the same way. And he is promising this new covenant to his people who are going into exile because they've broken the old covenant, because they haven't loved God with all their heart, soul, strength and mind. And this is a covenant that the Jews will finally uh, receive when their Messiah comes and calls them back. It's described in Zechariah chapter 10. So if you could turn to Zechariah chapter 10, um, and we'll read just a little bit of that. Zechariah chapter 10, um, verse, um, sorry, Zechariah 12, verse 10. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication so they will look on me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. In that day there will be great mourning in Jerusalem like the mourning of Hadadraman in the plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn, every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself and their wives by itself, by themselves. Uh, all the families that remain, every family by itself and the wives by themselves that remain at the end of the tribulation. I haven't read all of the chapter in Zechariah, but you could go back and read that, that those Jews that remain at the end of the tribulation. Verse 13, in that day, a fountain will be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for sin and for impurity. It will come about in that day, declares the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols from the land and they will no longer be remembered. And I will also remove the prophets and the un clean spirit from the land and if anyone still prophesies then his father and mother who gave birth to him will say you shall not live for you have spoken falsely in the name of the Lord and his father and his mother who gave him birth to him will pierce him through when he prophesies and it will also come about in that day that the prophets will each be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies and they will not put on a hairy robe in order to deceive but he will say I am not a prophet I am a tiller of the ground for a man sold me as a slave in my youth 
um, and one will say to him, what are these wounds between your arms? And he will say, those were with, with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man, my associate, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd that the sheep may be scattered and I will turn my hand against the little ones. It will come about in all the land, declares the Lord, that two parts in it will be cut off and perish, and the third will be left in it. And I will bring the third part through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. This whole description in Zechariah of what is coming, the fact that God will restore them, but it will be after the day um, when two thirds of the nation of Israel will be cut off and perish and only one third will be brought through. And um, those, what that one third will have looked upon him whom, he, whom they pierced and mourned over him as of an only son. What's the basis for this covenant? It's the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, Matthew 26, 27 to 28, Mark 14, 22 to 24, and Luke 22, verse 19 to 20. This new covenant had the possibility of being inaugurated at Jesus' first coming. I mean, of course, God knew that it wouldn't be so, but just in human terms, it had the possibility if the Jews had accepted and received their Messiah, if they had put their trust in the Lord Jesus, if they had said, you are our God, then this new covenant would have come into effect. But because they didn't, because they rejected him, um, the uh, new covenant has come into effect spiritually uh, and those individual Jews coming in to believe in the Lord Jesus, um, they ha are spiritually part of this new covenant. And also, as we know, that uh, it was put out to Gentiles, which we're going to talk about more next week. But because uh, the Jews didn't receive Messiah and rejected him, uh, because they rejected God and rejected this new covenant, God has sent the gospel, the, the possibility out to the rest of the world. And you and I, have put our trust in uh in in jesus and so are part of this new covenant let's look at matthew 12 31 to 37 matthew chapter 12 31 to 37 matthew 12 31 to 37 there are therefore um i say to you any sin and blasphemy shall not be forgiven people but blasphemy against the spirit shall sorry Therefore, I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, um, but blasphemy against the spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the son of man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Either make the tree good and its fruit good or make the tree bad and its fruit bad for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak what is good for the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. For by your words, you will be justified and by your words, you will be condemned. And it's really important that we understand the scriptures in the context in which they're spoken. Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees and the leaders of the people of Israel, and they have just seen him exercise a mute demon out of a man. And that could only be done by God because demons spoke usually. They used human voices to speak. And Jesus has just um, given this man back his speech and um, proved himself to be the savior. And But these Pharisees and the leaders of the people are denying. They're just saying to him, you're doing that by Beelzebub. You're doing that by the work of Satan. And he's saying, if I cast out demons by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. How can anyone enter a strong man's house? Uh, therefore I say to you, and he goes on, he who is not with me is against me. And who does, he who does not gather with me scatters 
And then the passage I read, therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. This is the unpardonable sin. This is the unpardonable sin that the nation of Israel are blaspheming the work of the Holy Spirit. They are saying that the work of the Holy Spirit is actually the work of Satan. And they are um, applying to the Holy Spirit the work of Satan. And that is unforgivable. What is, what is the unforgivable sin? That generation has rejected the Messiah, and that cannot be forgiven. Unbelief cannot be forgiven. That is the only unforgivable sin. And in this context, it is spoken to the nation. And everywhere that you look, what you will see is this generation, this generation, this generation has rejected Messiah and therefore cannot be forgiven this generation this generation not the individuals within it but the generation because god deals corporately with israel he always deals corporately with them and he pronounces his judgments corporately do you think all the way through the old testament when god judged his people and sent them into exile and they were all sorts of consequences do you think there was nobody around who was believing god and trusting him and had faith in him of course there were there were individual jews god says I have kept for myself a remnant who have not bowed the knee to Baal. There have always been people who trusted and believed in the Lord God, and he has always seen them, but he has decided to deal with Israel, his covenant people, corporately. And here he talks about this sin that's committed by the nation of rejecting their Messiah, that it cannot be um, forgiven that it, they, they are the generation that forgiven him and they would go into judgment. That generation that rejected Christ would go into judgment and into judgment they went in AD 70 when Titus came and destroyed the temple and the nation of Israel. Millions of Jews died in that judgment. That's what it is. There is no, uh, the nation of Israel rejected at that time, rejected their Messiah. And as a nation, they were judged. There were individuals, those individuals started the church. The ones who believed in him started the church. But the physical judgment for the rejection by the nation still took place, even though John and Peter and Matthew and all of those, they had believed. Even though Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea had believed, even though people had believed, individuals, even though they had believed, the judgment still came on Israel because God deals corporately with his nation of Israel. So you and I, because corporately they rejected Messiah, then the gospel went out to the Gentiles. We're going to talk about that. A lot more in the weeks to come but because they rejected messiah you and i were able to hear the gospel and be saved and those individual jews who trusted that jesus was the messiah who believed that he was messiah who followed him they too were saved they too received redemption but it didn't change the physical judgment that came upon israel at that time and that's something for us to understand you know the new covenant was inaugurated in the blood of jesus christ it was he says to his disciples this is the blood of the new covenant this is my blood shed for you and so this is the inauguration of the new covenant and you and i are allowed to come in and partake of that new covenant whereby god writes his law on our hearts and in ezekiel we're told he gives us a new heart actually and a new spirit we are able to come into that covenant because the nation of israel rejected their messiah so Jew who believes, Gentile who believes, we now come in to this new covenant inaugurated by the blood of Jesus Christ or with the blood of Jesus Christ. Um, but the nation that rejected him, um, rejected him corporately as a nation and, and were destroyed. And even to that, this day, think about that, even to this day, the Jews cannot worship 
properly. They cannot uh, receive forgiveness because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. They can't bring a sacrifice because they have no temple. They cannot worship God even if they want to because they have no temple. The time of, their, of his first visitation was the time that as a nation, corporately, they would have been able to receive him. And now, corporately, as a nation, that will not happen until the end of the tribulation. Remember it, remember it. This is God's revealed plan. This is his revealed purpose. And we have to align ourselves with that. We live in a time between their rejection of Messiah and the second coming of Messiah. We live in the church age. We live in the breathing space as it were, between the, the, his first coming and his second coming. We live in a time where we are supposed to be calling out the gospel message to everyone, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, calling them, calling them, calling them. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. He will forgive you of your sins. He will begin to transform you so that you can be the person that God has always intended for you to be. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. We have a limited time. I know it seems long because it's been going on since, you know, since the time of Jesus' death and resurrection, and, and, and we're 2,020 years later, I know that it seems like, is, is it really ever coming? I know I have the shadow of that thought, you know, but, but we have the revealed will of God, and we have his spirit living within us to give us understanding. And you and I have been left here. I said it last week, and I'll say it again. We have been left here in the palace that we call the Western civilization we have been left here in this palace to bring about the proclamation of the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, to be able to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvellous light, to, to proclaim the fact that we have been given a new spirit and a new heart. And it's not true anymore. As Jeremiah had said earlier in his, in his message, the heart is deceitful above all else and desperately wicked. I think it's Jeremiah 17 verse 9. Who can understand it? You and I don't have that heart. We have a new heart. We have a new heart, one on which God has written his laws. And, and we understand and we know that God is calling us to love him with all of our hearts, to love him. And the way that that shows itself is that we love our neighbor as ourselves. And it is in that love and in the working out in the new covenant by the new heart that he's given us and the new spirit who lives within us. It is in that covenant that we are able to live and move and have our being and spread the gospel message to a people who are so desperately in need of the truth, the truth of who God is and what has he done. We know his promises. We know his promises. God um, describes to us this whole process in the New Testament. We have Jesus' words in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We have the amplification of his words in the rest of the New Testament. We have the promise of his coming in the Old Testament and the, and the detailed prophecies of what he would do and what he would say. And we have that reiterated in the New Testament. We have the full word of God. We have his word. We have his outspoken thoughts. We have his, the word, his character revealed in words. We know who he is from the outside. We hear, we read, we see, and we know who he is from the inside. And we have this this amazing time right now to tell other people about our God, about a God who is calling them individually to come to him. Um, Jeremiah is being told to tell his people all about this new covenant. And again, as usual, I haven't got to the end of my notes. I wanted to talk about how Jeremiah is called to do something that looks ridiculous to him. He is called to do something that looks completely crazy and to do it because he trusted that God, what God had said 
would come to pass. We'll have to talk about it next week. I've just looked at the time and it's already 12 o'clock. So go over again, please. Uh, Jeremiah chapter um, 32. Well, um, yeah, chapter 32 where Jeremiah is going to be told to do something that would have just been ridiculous to him. And we can see uh, how he responded to it. And, um, uh, and we'll talk about that next time. God is calling us to do things that seem impossible to us, that seem often illogical to us, that humanly speaking, we don't understand. But he is calling us to trust him. And to do them on the basis of that trust. And so, um, yeah, I'm going to have to finish there. Think about the new covenant into which you have been drawn. Think about that corporately the nation of Israel were rejected then, or punished, sorry, destroyed then, because of their rejection of the Messiah. But remember that every individual person, be they Jew or Gentile, now can come into the new covenant promised and inaugurated by the blood of Jesus, simply because God wants all to come to repentance and no one to perish, simply because he decided before the foundation of the world, knowing that the first humans would deliberately disobey him and give the dominion and the authority of his creation or of the world to Satan, because he knew what was going to happen, because he knew in advance that they would choose not to love him. He made it possible for the whole of the human race to come back to him through the Messiah who would come at a specific point in time and who will come again at a specific time. And you and I are living in what the Bible, what God calls the latter days. We are, we are living in the time of the end. I don't know why it would be us. I don't know why God would decide that I would be born now in this time. I don't know when I look at myself and I see the weakness in me and the lack of strength. I don't know why he would call me for such a time as this, but I know that he has. And I know that the Lord, my rock, is training my hands for battle and my fingers for war. And I know that he's doing that for you too. And I pray that you would continue to believe the impossible or to believe the things that look impossible because they're spoken to you by the God to whom nothing is impossible. Father God, I thank you for your word and I thank you for the way that you minister it to us by your spirit. And I thank you that you have given us this new heart within us. And I praise you for it, Lord, and ask that you would um, continue to train our hands for battle and our fingers for war, Lord, that you would continue to make us ready to do what you are calling us to do, that you would continue in these days of trial, Lord, to sharpen us and to um, enable us, Lord, to speak clearly to understand the reality of our salvation, your deliverance, Lord God, to, to, re to realise the, the fullness of our redemption in Christ Jesus, to understand who he is, who you are, Lord God, and who we are in him, and to, and to boldly, boldly step out, Lord God, to do as those early believers did, that in the time when they were under pressure, to stop talking about Jesus, just as we are under pressure in our limited ways, to stop talking about Jesus, that they didn't pray for you to take the persecution away, the trouble away, the difficulty away. No, Lord Jesus, they prayed that you would make them bold and give them courage to speak the truth. And that's my prayer for us, Lord God, that you would give us the courage and the boldness to speak out the truth. Give us the words to say and when to say it, Lord. Help us to see clearly the, the way, the reason that we have been left here and the way forward, Father. Oh, Father, and help us to um, do, as I think I said right at the beginning, as you tell me in Psalm 138, to call out to you, because on the day that I call, you will answer me and make me bold with strength in my soul. And I pray that for all of us, Lord, in Jesus' name and for his great glory. Amen.